All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? Thank you again so much for joining me. I really appreciate you watching. If you like what you're hearing and seeing, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave comments down below. It just helps keep this channel exciting and engaging for everybody watching, and uh, certainly for myself included. So we are going to talk about the next section on the overhead that we haven't covered yet, and that would be the ventilation section here. So most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today has to do with the avionics cooling system on board the airplane and you know how it relates, of course, directly to these buttons up here. So this is certainly one of those topics that we could dig very deep on, and I'm going to do my best job to just kind of keep this somewhat generalized today because I just want you to walk away with some just some basic knowledge about, like I said, how the airplane does this job of cooling the avionics and, you know, given different scenarios that we could look at. So, like I said, we, we could dice everything up uh, into fine, you know, really, really small detail, but I, I just want you to have some general understanding about this system and why it's there and what it does for us. So, first of all, like I said, you know, modern aircraft, and this is certainly not specific to the Airbus, but pretty much every airplane rolling off the assembly lines these days has a, a huge amount of computers on board them that just allows them to do the things they do and, and helps them function the way they're designed to function. So just a couple photos I wanted to show you here. This is the, the avionics compartment access door here. So you can kind of take a look up and see, you know, what, what this, this specific area on the airplane looks like. So you have all these racks up there that, that uh, like I said, we have these computers that, that reside up there and do what they do. And, you know, as you would assume, with, with having this many computers on board an airplane, just, you know, the inherent nature of how these things operate, is they actually generate a tremendous amount of heat in, in doing their, their jobs that they normally do. And we know, you know, just basic, you know, computer science and electronics, you know, it, it tells us that, you know, computers, of course, are happy when they're kept cool. And that's, of course, you know, why we need to have this this robust and redundant system on the airplane that does this job of keeping this compartment cool down there. And it also does a job of exhausting any smoke that might be occurring down there if one of these was having a problem or started to smolder or something of this nature uh, was occurring. We, we need to have a, a way to address that. So we are going to break down, like I said, the, the different modes of operation that the ventilation system you know, uses on board the airplane. So there's really five different configurations that we're going to talk about today. And the, the first three, think of these as the, the normal modes or, you know, most days when we're flying around, you know, this is how the airplane operates, you know, when everything is going well, when everything's right. And the, the brilliant part about the system is it's completely automatic. So we're never having to really interact with the system as pilots. It's all just, you know, the plane is doing what it determines it needs to do when it you know knows, you know, Hey, this given temperature situation occurs and this is where the airplane is at. Um, like I said, it just knows when to switch between these different configurations without us even having to think about it or do or do anything. So it's kind of nice, uh, just one less thing to worry about as a pilot, I guess you could say. So the first three modes, like I said, we're going to talk about the the open mode, the closed mode, and the intermediate mode. And you know, like I started to say a moment ago, there's one really interesting point that I wanted to make mention of. And you know, like I said, I could show you this table that talks about, you know, hey, when there's a weight on wheel signal, when the thrust levers are doing a certain thing, and when a, a certain temperature is existing, you know, the, the plane, like I said, knows to configure this system um, as as outlined. But you know, the, the one specific one that I wanted to talk about was the the temperature trigger. Now, if you read through the, the Airbus manuals, they talk about, you know, two different times when the airplane is on the ground and when the aircraft is in uh, in flight uh, the plane is looking for a given temperature range and you know to, to make this changeover occur so if we're on the ground we're talking about changing over from the the open or the closed configuration if we're in flight we're talking about changing from the closed to the intermediate configuration and like i said they kind of draw out this temperature range so on the ground the changeover will occur uh, at 9 degrees Celsius with an increasing trend and at 12 degrees Celsius with a decreasing trend. If you're in flight, it'll occur at 32 degrees Celsius with an increasing trend and 35 degrees Celsius with a decreasing trend. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why didn't they make it simple and just kind of draw a line in the sand and say, hey, you know, at 10 degrees, you know, this changeover is going to happen. And it's kind of an in ingenious thing, I think. It makes a lot of sense. Well, the reason is you might have a, a atmospheric condition or a, a temperature situation, let's say, where that, that the, the temperature range is kind of teeter-tottering, you know, right back and forth potentially between that, that line and the sand that might have been drawn. So the, the plane would constantly be trying to switch back and forth these two modes 
um, if the system was designed in that way. So it kind of gives you an idea about, you know, why there's this little window and more importantly, why the plane is looking for a trend to trigger that change over to occur. So like I said, it's just, it's something that, that might be a little confusing when you first look at it in the manuals, but you know, when you stop and think about it, um, it, it does make, uh, make quite a bit of sense why they designed it the way they did. So Let's talk about each one of those first three modes specifically. So the first one we'll take a look at is the open configuration mode here. So uh, right off the bat, if you watch my videos before, you, you kind of hear me razz Airbus for the uh, the non-color coding and in, in all their graphics here. And uh, you know, so today, of course, we're we're gonna be stuck with another uh, gray and white uh, pictorial representation of this the ventilation system here. But I, I do want to call your your attention right off the bat to a couple things. Um, first of all, as we, as we look at all these graphics here, you're going to kind of see this shaded or this, these dotted areas in the system that just kind of tells us where exactly the air is moving through at you know, each given uh, phase or mode of operation we're going to talk about there. So just kind of keep that in mind as we talk about each one of these scenarios. Like I said, I'm going to try to do my best to keep it simple. Um, but um, another high level thing, um, the, the blower and the extract fans, um, they're always running every, or excuse me, any time that we have normal uh, power applied to the airplane. So it's just really what's changing as we talk through all these different scenarios here is just actually the kind of valves that kind of move around the system to get the air to route into different places and, and do this job of cooling the avionics in a, in a slightly different manner. So just a couple things to keep in mind. But like I said, on most normal days when we're operating from a mildish temperature up through a hot temperature, um, the system, like I said, is in this open configuration. So it's taking outside air and it's actually continuously circulating it through that compartment down there and it's allowing this heat to be exhausted. So um, there's these two valves. There's, a, there's an inlet valve and there's an extract valve. And I wanted to, to show you some photos of those. I thought, you know, people are probably curious about that. So I was doing a walk around the other day and I just snapped a couple photos on the outside of the airplane just to show you what they look like if you were curious. So this here we are on the left side of the airplane, just kind of below the, the cockpit area there. This is the inlet valve, and it's, of course, open here. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. Uh, another photo shows on the right side of the airplane now. This is the extract valve. So um, if you guys were, were ever observing Airbuses and just wondering what, what exactly these doors were, that, that is the, uh, the inlet and the extract valves, like I said, that allow for this, this outside air to be circulated through the avionics compartment to do the job of keeping those computers cooled down. Now, a um, couple uh, things to mention about, you know, just the design of the system here. So, like I said, there's, there's a moment ago when I talked about, you know, kind of the, uh, a mild temperature up through a, a warmer temperature, the system would be in this, the, the full open configuration. Well, if it starts to get cool, um, think about, you know, the atmospheric things that happen, you know, when, when temperatures get cold, there, there's a, a higher susceptibility of condensation um, being possible at forming. And of course, you know, general computer stuff, we, we want to keep these things dry down there and we don't want to allow them to accumulate condensation for obvious reasons. So the plane will actually switch over to the, the closed configuration. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit in a, in a second here. But uh, in that closed configuration, um, it is, uh, it's closing those doors basically and it's cooling the avionics in a slightly different manner. So let's, let's take a look at that next. So in the closed configuration, so like I said, you either we're operating on the ground in, in a very cold environment or most of the time we're flying around uh, most every day, uh, normal atmospheric conditions, the, the plane goes into this closed configuration here. So you can see um, these, the inlet valve and the extract valves actually it's closed and there's, there's a few more valves that open up that, that are um, essentially circulating air you know, from the, the cargo section and the avionics base section. And they're kind of keeping it enclosed in this whole system here that, that um, what it actually does is a um, really interesting thing on the Airbus. I found this fascinating when I first learned this airplane. I hadn't seen this before, but it actually uses this skin heat exchanger system to take the hot air that's you know, created down here in the avionics bay and it routes it through this piping that goes along the skin of the airplane, which obviously, as we know, when an airplane is flying around and you know, the upper atmosphere, it's very cold outside and there's you know, way more than enough you know, temperature difference there to kind of extract this heat out of the system just by running the hot air around the skin there and, um, you know, letting that the temperature change occur. And then we can kind of circulate it back through the whole system, back through the, the avionics compartment. It just kind of does this continuous job of keeping that area cool down there, if that makes sense. So uh, there's one other graphic I pulled out of another manual that kind of uh, is a little bit easier on the eyes or, or a little bit more, um, 
it might make a little bit more sense to you if you're just kind of curious about this closed configuration. Like I said, we're, we're just circulating this air all through, you know, the, the interior portions of the airplane, and, and that's how we're doing the, the job of cooling. So the next mode uh, that we're going to talk about is the intermediate configuration. And the, the reason why this is designed in the situation, or into the system rather, is let's say that the, the skin uh, heat exchanger is not cutting it, or it's not providing enough cooling to the system. You know, the, the reason why this would be the case is, you know, let's say the outside skin temperature for whatever reason is actually, you know, quite warm, which like I said, this is a really rare circumstance, um, but it is a possibility when these planes are flying around. So if the, the system detects uh, this condition being present, it'll go into this intermediate mode. And all that it does is it opens that outlet valve uh, just partially to allow for some additional uh, hot air to be exhausted outside of the system. And it just it does what it does, and it, and it uh, helps the, the plane keep keep everything cool as it's designed to do. So, like I said, that, that kind of covers the, the three normal modes of operation. Um, the, the next two that we're going to talk about are the, the abnormal and the smoke configurations. So let's first talk about this the abnormal configuration. Um, like I said, with both of these, these modes here, these modes require some pilot intervention to, uh, to get ourselves into this configuration. So we act actually have to reach up, manipulate the buttons on the overhead to get the plane to do this. But you know, let's, let's first talk about this, the abnormal configuration, or the way that I think of this is the faulted configuration. So if there was um, something happening with either the blower fan or the extract fan themselves, we could get a fault in the system. And so we have to, you know, the, think of it like in the sense that the cooling um, capabilities of the airplane have been cut down significantly so we have to have another way to get some cold air down there or to get some cooling onto the avionics so actually what happens is with uh, both this configuration the next one we're going to talk about there is a an air conditioning valve that opens up that allows some of that cold air that was being pumped into the cabin from the packs to actually be routed down into the avionics section there and like we said it's, it's just you know designed this way to provide some additional cooling uh, to the system as a whole to keep those avionics cool down there. So like I said, if we, we reach up and, and push one of those buttons into the override uh, uh, position of the button there, it's going to uh, cause a few different things to happen, you know, which we'll kind of break down in a second. But like I said, just most important thing to understand is that we're introducing this additional cold air from the air conditioning system into the mix here and, and getting it to, to cool everything down for us. So that is the abnormal configuration. Now the last one uh, we're going to talk about is the smoke configuration. So if there was something bad happening down there with one of the computers and it's uh, it's smoldering or it's you know, it's making smoke essentially, um, we want to have a way to get that smoke outside of the the airplane and, and you know prevent it from circulating its way through the cabin or you know keeping heat inside you know that compartment down there. So the plane does something a little bit different. Uh, we'll enter the smoke configuration when we actually uh, put both the switches in the override position there. But like I said, same thing happens where the, the air conditioning valve opens up here and allows that additional cold air and, and additional physical like amount of air to pass through the system um, in the hope that we're kind of able to purge out this smoky air from the system. But you know, the other big thing that happens is, you know, look what's happened with our, our skin uh, heat exchanger piping up here. That's closed off as well. because you want to prevent this smoky air from, from circulating that that area of the airplane, you know, really the, the important thing here is that we just want to get it off the airplane. We want to get it overboard. So uh, like we said, um, what happens when you go into this smoke configuration, the blower fan turns off, the extract fan continues to run, and there's actually a, a, a little door that opens up uh, that's, that's separate from the, the normal uh, outlet valve there. That I can kind of show you if we look at that, the walk around slide there again uh, that opens up. Uh, it's this little guy right here, it's kind of interesting. Uh, and it just, like I said, it, it allows for this, this smoky, poisonous air to be dumped overboard. So hopefully, like I said, very general on all the descriptions there, but hopefully all that stuff makes sense to you guys. Leave comments in the, um, the, the section down below if you, if you have any for me on that one. So um, let's move over and, and talk, uh, coming back to our slide here, I'm, I've just done a lights test once again, so we can just kind of see like all the different indications that we might notice on this ventilation panel here. And, you know, one of the other things you're going to notice is this, the cabin fans button here. Now this is actually the cabin recirculation 
uh, fans that this button has to do with. And you know, we'll kind of talk about in a second, you know, well, why did they co-locate this cabin fans button on this ventilation panel here? And it has to do with, you know, when we put the airplane into the smoke configuration, we're trying to get smoke, you know, out of the, the internal you know, portion of the airplane there. But, you know, first of all, just, just to recap and talk about those cabin fans themselves, I'll, I'll bring up the slide here uh, from the, uh, the air conditioning um, uh, you know, portion of the FCOM there. But, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're uh, depicted here. Here's the button here, but it's, um, you know, these, these cabin fans, like we said, do this job of recirculating air uh, through the cabin. So it's, it's drawing in cabin air, running it through a filter and routing it back through the air conditioning system. And you, know, you might be wondering, you know, why do we have this system in place? Um, not only does it, it, it kind of keeps the, all the air, you know, fresh, fresh essentially and moving around throughout the cabin, but it actually does a job of, you know, distributing the air and, and it's, you know, kind of a, a, an ingenious way of getting a, a more even uh, cooling or heating or just the fact that we have the ability to mix this air up. And the way that I tell people to think about this is like, imagine like a, a bathtub. Let's say you had the, the bathtub filled with icy cold water and, you know, you decided you wanted to make the whole temperature inside the bathtub warmer as quickly as you possibly could. Well, you would, of course, you know, you'd reach over and you would turn the, the valve to open the hot water portion that allows it to, to introduce more hot water into the system. Well, if you just did that, and nothing else, um, you know, all the water would become, uh, you know, even temperature eventually. But if you wanted, like I said, for that, that process to happen more quickly, you could actually put your hand inside the tub and you could stir it all around. You could get that hot water moving around with the cold water and, you know, you would accomplish the task of just, like I said, making this even uniform temperature throughout the whole system. So that's really, you know, the, the simplified explanation of, you know, part of the reason why we have this, the cabin recirc fans on these airplanes and like I said, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But uh, let's come back and talk about the, the smoke condition uh, really quickly. And like I would mentioned a moment ago, you know, part of the reason why I feel like they, they co-located these buttons in the same area on the panel there. So um, if, you know, we did have some, uh, you know, smoke on board the airplane and we suspected it, you know, it was potentially coming from the avionics area down there, just right out of the, the QRH procedures here, it tells us to turn the, the ventilation blower and extract fans to the override position. It also turns us, or tells us to turn the cabin fans off. And, you know, once again, this makes a lot of sense. If you had some sort of uh, noxious fumes that were being created by the airplane, you wouldn't want to recirculate them back through the, the cabin and poison everybody's breathing air. So, like you said, you turn off the recirc fans in hopes of just getting the all that smoky air purged from the system before it's allowed to kind of recirculate through there and and make your situation even worse. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, I'll bring the slide up once again. So I just want to talk about uh, the buttons and the lights and the positions and the, the different things that we could see up here. So, you know, as with everything else in the Airbus, if it's pushed in forward position or, or in position rather, it's, it's lights are out. It's in the auto mode in the case of the ventilation uh, buttons here and uh, uh, cabin fans normally in the in position. Uh, they just come on automatically when the airplane has power applied to it. Uh, so, uh, pretty straightforward explanation about, you know, you know, if you reached up and pushed the button, you would, you know, tell the, the plane to turn the fans off. You'd see the off indication and the extract, uh, in the blower valves or, um, yeah, the, the, the fans buttons here. Let's just talk about, uh, specifically when you would see, uh, those fault lights come on. So in the blower switch, uh, fault light would come on for, uh, if the blower pressure is low. So if the fan speed was low, maybe. Uh, the duct overheats, uh, computer power supply fails, or a smoke warning is activated. And in the extract switch there, uh, the fault light would come on for an extract pressure uh, being low, uh, computer power supply fails, or if a smoke warning is activated. So, uh, And then, of course, if you reached up and you pushed the button, the, the switch would kind of pop out, so it's no longer in the auto mode, and it would go into the override mode. And uh, it would just tell us that the airplane, uh, like we said to recap, is in that abnormal configuration. It's, it's just behaving in a slightly different manner there. So, um, and just to get, uh, like I said, I didn't want to get too technical, but just to, to uh, wrap it up, if you're curious about, you know, how the plane uh, behaves in each one of these three scenarios, so you could either turn the blower only to override, you could turn the extract only to override, or you could turn them both to the override position, the plane is going to do slightly different things. I just want to kind of spell those out for you real quick. So, so to draw these out and try to make it as simple as possible, when you push the blower uh, push button here, you set it to the override position, it sends a signal to turn the blower itself off. 
uh, when you use the extract push button in the override mode here, uh, it, it also actually sends a signal to turn the blower fan off, but it directly controls the extract fan through the push button here, so it'll keep that on. And the, the third scenario, like we said, if you had these both pushed in at the same time, or excuse me, uh, pushed to the override position, uh, it just sends the signal to open up that little, the little, uh, the extra smoke valve, let's say, on the extract valve door there. So hopefully that kind of uh, draws apart those three different scenarios uh, if you were to use these buttons, like I said, one at a time or uh, both at the same time to get the airplane into the smoke configuration there. So. Uh, just a few other little small side notes that I wanted to add, uh, other things that I thought of. Um, coming back and talking about this business, where we were talking about the airplane when it was on the ground. And you had this, excuse me, you had this uh, uh, condition where the, the inlet valve is open. And let's just say there's some light rain falling outside, or maybe there's some moisture accumulated on the skin of the airplane. And it's, you know, there's this potential there that there's, you know, water that could be sucked up into the system. You might be looking at this thing thinking to yourself well how the heck do we prevent you know that moisture from getting down uh, into the the avionics compartment there and um, like i said just just right in the the schematic here there is a the depiction of this filter here but i just want to show you a picture of what that looks like specifically this is this is something that fascinated me and, and i was just curious you know exactly about how this system's doing what it's doing but you know essentially that air comes in through that inlet valve and it passes through this uh, this filter here and there's kind of this centrifugal motion of the air that occurs that allows the water to to separate out of the uh, the air itself and then it, it continues through this the, uh, the filter here itself which would take out any dust or dirt or anything like that and then it routes the air out through the system and through the avionics compartment and uh, keeps it it all clean and, and dry down there like we said so if you're curious uh, that is what the air filter looks like. And I also just want to show you a, a picture of the status uh, page, um, the, the cabin pressurization section here. We actually have an indication of what these inlet and outlet valves are doing at the, the given state of time. So we can see, you know, what, what's occurring outside the airplane. And of course, you know, this is the airplanes in this closed configuration because we're up in a crew scenario here. You can see we're up at a high altitude. We have a cabin pressure of 8,000 feet at this point. So like I said, the, the airplane is in that closed configuration and operating with that the skinny heat exchanger once again. But like I said, I just wanted to kind of draw your attention to the indications here that, that we can see exactly what those valves are doing. So that pretty much wraps up all of the technical stuff that I wanted to tell you today about the, the ventilation system and the panel up there. Uh, we'll jump into the Q&A section. So I had a... Uh, uh, a person right in so uh, first of all Jonathan uh, thank you again for tuning into the videos wherever you're at I uh, really appreciate you watching uh, but Jonathan had a question he said um, I read on the Airbus 320 QRH tail strike section um, I don't understand why but it asks you to turn pack one and two off in the event of a tail strike and this is a really good question um, I think if you know at first glance you would think to yourself well you know these are you know somewhat not related, uh, you know, actions. Let's let's say if you had a tail strike, well, what the heck does the the packs have to do with that? Well, um, let's take a look just uh, right out of the QRH is exactly what the procedure is if we had a tail strike. Well, we're going to um, maintain a max altitude of 10,000 feet or the MEA, whichever is lower. We're going to turn the ram air switch to the on position. We're going to turn pack one and two off. So essentially, what we're doing is we're we're depressurizing the airplane or, or prevent it from pressurizing in the first place if we suspect that we had a tail strike. Now, why is this? Well, think about it. if you think you've struck the the tail in the airplane, you might have potentially like you've you compromised the structure of the fuselage. So maybe something get, got bent out of shape. Maybe something got cracked or fatigued or you know, any number of things could happen if you have a tail strike. So you don't really know the the uh, physical condition of the fuselage and how strong it might be. And if something's been compromised back there, and if you were to try to pressurize the airplane, you're just putting all this undue uh, stress on, on the airframe itself. This is, of course, something that if you thought you had some damage from a tail strike, you wouldn't want to make any worse. So that's kind of the mentality about, you know, keeping the plane depressurized. You know, so if you think about, you know, once again, when a, when a plane pressurize itself there's actually a tremendous amount of stored up pressure like inside the pressure vessel that is the fuselage and there's a tremendous amount of forces and stresses that are uh, that are occurring just as a result of doing this so like we said Jonathan just the idea is that we're we're keeping the airplane from becoming any more stressed and possibly failing any further um, in the event that we think we might have had a, a tail strike and, and something is compromised back there. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Once again, I really appreciate you, you tuning in and, and writing in the question. It gives me something to talk about. 
And the last thing I want to talk about, uh, once again, uh, Abby Thomas uh, has been uh, tuning in for a while now, but he had asked a question uh, several segments ago where I talked about the, um, a portion of the, the ice uh, or the anti-icing system in the airplane. And, you know, go back and watch that video if you kind of want the background of this discussion. But he had asked about this little ice probe that sticks off the, um, the front of the airplane there and allows us to, to see when we're accumulating ice. And he just wanted to know what this probe looked like at night because I had kind of talked about in uh, one of the last discussions there, I kind of felt it was uh, it was kind of hard to see at night. Uh, but this is this is a photo of it. I took this you know last week when we were just cruising around. But you can kind of see this this interior illumination that happens in the post that you know kind of is designed to shine outwards and, and allow us to see if there's ice accumulating on the probe. But like I said in the last video, it is actually kind of hard to see at night, and uh, it's just an interesting thing about you know the, the the design that Airbus chose to go with with this for this portion of the system there. So like you said, that is what it looks like at night, Abby. And you know maybe this this picture doesn't really do it justice because my camera captured a lot of light coming out of this thing. But when you look at it with the the naked eye, it is actually kind of faint, and it's just it is hard to see. And um, it's just an interesting thing about the Airbus there. So. As always, guys, I, I really appreciate everybody tuning in. If you have questions, leave them down below. And uh, until the next time, thanks again for watching. We'll, we'll talk real soon.